Hi, everybody. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm here with Alex Knapp, who is Senior Editor, Healthcare Science. I'm going to toss sustainability in there, too. Alex, um, what's on your radar right now? Uh, I think the biggest story of this week is, is probably the announcement that the Lawrence National Lab achieved net energy on a fusion, fusion reaction. Yes. Well, can you unpack that for us? Because obviously fusion, I mean, if those who haven't read it, what's the big deal? We've been talking about this for so long. So is it that holy grail, we finally achieved it? it I mean, it's an important step along the way. So fusion is the same, you know, physics and chemistry, the power of the sun. Mm -hmm. um, only obviously on a much uh, smaller scale. And one of the, the challenges with this, I mean, this is also what's behind nuclear weapons, you know, that, that's what they cause Hooray. a fusion reaction. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in terms of energy production, the, the potential is that for a very small amount of fuel, you can power a lot of things in a way that doesn't have any negative carbon emissions. And unlike conventional nuclear reactors, there's also no radiation or Less any volatility, risk. volatility, yeah. It is, I mean, it almost sounds too good to be true. And it kind of is because it's very, very hard to do in a way where you're not putting more energy into the thing than you're actually getting out, which is what you want to and do. Is this a step in the basic science or is this actually a, a real step toward commercialization where like a year or two years from now, it could start to transform the energy picture? So, so the joke that I made with our energy editor, Chris Hellman, about this is that my whole life I've been reading about fusion. So since I was a kid in the 80s and reading Omni, Fusion was always 20 years away. Mm -hmm. It was 20 years away in the 80s. It was 20 years away in the 90s. It was 20 years away in the in the noughties, which is what I like to call is the, it the 2000s. The That's right. That's right. So, um, and I would say now it's going to be 10 years away for a while. Okay. Well, <laughs> that is a big all step. All right. That's that's optimism. So that's good. So we've got fusion, and that you know the energy picture broadly is something people are thinking about. Yeah. Um, anything before we move off that, like because we're you know, people are, we're seeing energy prices go down. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you think is going to be sustainable or um, anything on that front? I do. And, and in fact, one interesting thing um, that's been a consequence of Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a lot of people realized how vulnerable they are and how dependent they are on these foreign supplies of energy. Entire nation of Germany, for right. example. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so what I've been hearing um, from from folks that I talk to is that people are really accelerating towards wind, solar, geothermal, um, not only because these things have markedly come down in price. I mean, solar and wind in many places are cheaper than coal. Yeah. Um, so there's the, the money side of it. But then there's also just once you've got those solar power set up, you're not, the, it's there. You're not right. relying on anything else. You're not relying on supply chains. It, it allows for an independence and freedom that other forms of energy don't. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing a lot of really great advances. And, uh, you know, as we're getting better at building durable grids, uh, mm -hmm. that can take advantage of these sustainable sources, uh, I think you're definitely going to see an acceleration. We actually, and, and it's an interesting point, counterpoint. So Texas, the last couple of years, which is still, uh, although they've been adopting some sustainable uh, energies, has really been more in the traditional fossil fuel, things like that. So in they literally had, in their backyard. I can yeah, understand exactly, it, right? Exactly. Um, but they had a bad winter where they saw blackouts and, and other right. challenges with their energy. They saw a bad summer with rolling blackouts, rolling brownouts. Meanwhile, California, which has really pushed forward on sustainable energy, on smart grids, things like that, they had one of their hottest summers on record virtually no brownouts or blackouts because they had that reliability that you can get when you're not dependent on supply chains and you're not dependent on the energy being produced hundreds of miles away. You can just have it right there in your backyard. Which is good, but I just met a real estate developer who said that he will never again develop, can't develop affordable housing in, in the New York area, in Florida, or California. He's going to avoid them forevermore because Partly the cost base, but also just the climate risk and the risk of these black swan events such as, you know, wildfires and such. So I suppose no brownouts, but still 
climactically challenged, I suppose we're, but let's, let's talk about some of the other science innovations because it does feel, especially this week, you know, when we're talking about the advances in AI, we hit a new, you know, that's now something that feels like we've got natural language processing that can educate our kids and perhaps write our stories too, right? <laughs> Well, if you've if you've had a chance to play with Jet, Chat GPT a little bit, it you know it it might be a nightmare for middle school teachers, but it doesn't really write at a level much. Yep, eighth grade that. is that the barometer? Eighth there? grade, I'm going to say, is about the barometer, and and even then, when you I I toyed a lot with it, much to the chagrin of my colleagues, because mm -hmm. I kept posting screenshots. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to break. Um, and it's and you you it's pretty easy to see where the seams and the programming are and things like that. So, I I do think that it's a pretty remarkable advance in uh, in, in kind of the evolution of AI. Um, is it that much better than Siri or Alexa? You know, that's that's you know, the it, thing that I it, wonder about. It puts it on a it puts it on our radar in a different way because yeah. it, and also what's interesting it feels like AI was a scary bot that would come take your jobs. Now that we're, you know, I don't know if jobs are plentiful, but there's still talent shortages. It feels like our mindset around AI has shifted to being a bit more positive. Is that fair to say, or am I being too no, optimistic? No, I definitely think that's fair to say. And, you know, machine learning has really advanced over the last few years. And you're seeing a lot of machine learning um, and artificial intelligence applications uh, and things like drug discovery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a, a company called Abcella, which during the pandemic, uh, they have a technology combining some traditional scientific drug discovery with some machine learning, mm -hmm. and they were able to work with Lilly to put one of the first therapeutics on the market, mm -hmm. which sadly COVID has uh, mutated so much that initial treatment doesn't work anymore. They are able to do it very quickly, and, and that's in part because of some of the things that we've done in machine learning. Uh, but one thing that you learn if you dive really deeply into a lot of these machine learning applications is that the human element is still very important, and uh, I always like to recommend Gary Kasparov's book, where he talks about how this is the former chess great. For, yes, former from chess Russia. great, anti-Putin chess great. Yes, I should add. Yeah. <laughs> um, and who famously lost to IBM's Deep That's Blue right. like way back in the '90s with chess. Um, but he's been a proponent of, of using, um, you know, using the advances of computing hand in hand with the things that that humans are better at to kind of like get the best of both worlds. And, and there's actually been an interesting evolution in chess and AI. Um, so in the world- Somebody the, really defeated Magnus Carlsen, <laughs> is that it? As opposed to like, ah, eh, he cheated. Well, no, I mean, it, computers have been able to beat chess players for forever. I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, since the 90s, since Deep Blue, computers have only gotten better. But the way that the older style chess engines worked was very much kind of brute force. It was literally very quickly, this computer is calculating all the possibilities and picking the mathematically best one. Blitzkrieg to, chess. Exactly. Blitzkrieg chess is a great way to put it. Um, but the newer chess models and other game models that have developed um, with the machine learning algorithms as opposed to this brute force computation have actually accelerated like humans couldn't really learn anything from brute force calculation. So is it more seductive form of it's chess? A little, like, it's a more seductive move, because you know. it's it's better at strategy. Okay. Um, you know the 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 previous engines were great at tactics, um, but but kind of lousy at strategy. But now we have got computers that develop lines of strategic thinking. Humans can learn from lines of strategic strategic thinking. Yeah. And learn things like adding a little deception to your game of chess and adding more of that kind of human element. Um, there's an article recently, and I I can't remember what outlet, but if you look up- Let's just that, say Forbes. I, I want, just <laughs> pretend. We'll pretend it was Forbes. I'm yeah. actually pretty sure it was The Atlantic, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. But, yeah. uh, but talking about how chess has started to take on a lot of the elements of poker that has become a much more playing the player that's kind of game. That's interesting. My son and that's used to play chess and now loves poker. Yeah, and so that's because of like... a lot of the... There's a lot of crossovers. So Jennifer Shadad, who's one of the, uh, a chess grandmaster, brilliant tournament player. She's also um, works with one of the online poker companies and is a big poker player and a spokesperson for poker. The Queen's Gambit has, I'm sure, brought a lot more yes. girls into chess. But I want to step back a sec with, with technology because I'd say that's one of, regardless of what happens in the economic climate, every 
company you talk to talks about digital transformation. Yeah. I don't know if that's a surrogate for some form of AI machine learning because otherwise, what is it, you know? Um, but when you think about, you talked about earlier with Fusion, 10 years, mm -hmm. does it feel like we're at a pivot point right now where this truly, you know, if you don't get on, you know, I don't know what you'd call the right term, but, but if you don't get on board essentially that you're going to miss the next two years are going to be truly transformative for a lot of businesses, or is that, I'm making you a soothsayer here yeah, that maybe well, you don't want to be. I, I definitely think for a lot of industries, um, you know, some of the advances in, in digital, in software, um, automation, even if it's dumb automation, uh, are really dumb happening Dumb automation? Well, is... you know, things things uh, like the real basic chatbots, okay, or, or just right. being able to automate some of the tedious data entry. My holiday and shopping, like that. that sort of thing, yeah. That's, um, well, now talk about more, are there anything else when you, healthcare is a huge realm. You mentioned yeah. a little bit about drug discovery. Um, we are in the, I hope if it's the final stage of the pandemic, who knows about that? But what is it, what's happening on the healthcare front that we should really pay attention to? Um, so this these coming couple of decades are uh, decades where we are finally starting to see not just treatments for disease but real cures for disease. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, the FDA recently approved um, a drug for hemophilia. That right now the treatment for hemophilia is you got to go in and get an the infusion. royal disease, isn't the it? The royal disease, yeah. yes. So which causes your blood to not clot. Mm -hmm. So the treatment for that is you got to go in every few weeks and get an infusion of these proteins that allow your blood to clot uh, normally. But there's now a gene therapy that goes in, fixes your DNA, and I mean we'll see how long lasting the treatment is. Mm -hmm. But at least for we know for a few years it drastically reduces the need for any mm -hmm. other ancillary treatment. Um, we're seeing some gene therapies go down to the pipeline for other diseases too. And excitingly, I mean, there's a lot of rare diseases and it's great to see those get attention, but even more common things like di type one diabetes. Um, that we there, can actually And cystic fibrosis. Yep. Y yeah, by actually just fixing the genes um, because these are all typically genetic disorders. And that's what I personally find very exciting. Where it's going to challenge economically is they're expensive. So the hemophilia drug I mentioned, one dose, which is all you need, is three and a half million dollars. Now, over the course of your life, the the cost of treatment is, you know, several times that amount, which is why How do you even the FDA approved that? the drug. I mean, you've right. got that's I, the question. I hear about things like you know somebody <laughs> buys the EpiPen, who shall remain nameless, but went to jail, and and all of a sudden that gets quadrupled or whatever in price, but. Three and a half million, like, I get drug discovery is expensive. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. still the place where it's like, here's where we make our money and the rest of the world is where we do our, our you couldn't charge that in most markets. Well, you know, th that's, market, what's, that's what's going to be the challenge. So these things are, ter they're terrifically expensive to develop. They're also terrifically, the, the newer gene therapies, they're expensive to manufacture and make mm -hmm. sure that they work properly. Um, and what the FDA did as part of the approval process was basically the, the committee there said, look, over the course of this patient's lifetime, it is going to cost them several times more than three and a half million dollars. So while yes, this one dose that he's spending in this year is more than he would normally you know, be spending in one year, over the course of his life, especially assuming that it's durable and he won't need another shot, 15, 20 years down the road, which we're really not going to know until we get there, um, then it's an overall savings. But our, you know, the, the system isn't really built for that. Uh, not here, not Europe, other places. So we just hope it's like bananas. The yeah. price goes down at some point, right? right. For, so you've talked about things that are, you said the word decades. Is there anything in the next year, like just to bring it closer to home, if we said 2023, is there anything in that realm where you'd say, stay tuned, look for this? Uh, I would say stay tuned for potentially uh, a COVID flu combination shot, um, which Yay. I've seen. You know, it's one less shot. <laughs> okay. My kid is excited. Yeah, I, I, I regret to inform you, you'll probably have to get a COVID booster every year like you get your flu shot. But 
Uh, several of the big manufacturers are working on a combination. So one shot, you're taken care of. And when I talked with um, Drew Weissman, who's one of the scientists at University of Pennsylvania who helped develop mm-hmm. um, develop mRNA technology, mm-hmm. he says theoretically you could get over a dozen vaccines in a single shot. and Protect that you may- against every variant not just thus not far just COVID, known to man, right? And, and and other diseases too. The the normal shots it might be tetanus, it might be mm-hmm. measles, it might be whatever. Um, you know, all of that is, is possible uh, with the mRNA technology. Excellent. Well, something to look forward to. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure.